Hello Saints, today's study is uh, going to be about the body of Christ and specifically it's going to be about the uh, judgment seat of Christ and uh, so did you know that the word judgment appears 294 times in the King James Bible? You know, God is a righteous judge, a God of judgment. And, you know, I, I often shake my head when I hear people say, don't judge. They say, don't judge lest ye be judged. And stop. They forget the rest of the passage. And that's typical of non-believers who claim not to believe in God, but use his words when it's convenient for them and it's always out of context. There's many types of different judgments in scripture and they all apply to different people during different times and for different reasons. But one particular judgment happens to be specifically for the body of Christ. That's us folks. Don't think you're getting away without answering for everything you've done in Christ. Meaning everything you've done from the first day of being saved to the last breath you take here on earth or until the very moment Christ Jesus calls us unto him at the rapture believers will escape judgment for their sins because our sins have been paid for in full and were made righteous in Christ when God looks at us he doesn't see the sins we've committed. He doesn't see us as sinful people that we should that we really are. What he sees is his son's righteousness covering us. He sees his son. He sees us as new creatures. Our sins have been removed and remembered no more, separating us from our sins as far as the east is from the west. But one thing will not escape is the judgment seat of Christ. Some people also call it the Bema seat judgment. Why the word Bema is used I'm not sure. I'll have to do maybe do a study on that one and perhaps you know make a video on it later on. Uh, it's probably a, a the Greek word for judgment seat or Latin word I'm not sure. So this Bema judgment is definitely one judgment that you want to be a part of. Jesus Christ will be judging us based on what we've done during our stay here on planet Earth. Yes, folks, this is the one and only time that our works come into play. And this judgment isn't going to be all claps and cheers either. There will be a lot, a lot of sorrow and, and a lot of regret taking place, unfortunately. In Ephesians 2, we read, let me get it on screen for you. In Ephesians 2, we read the, the famous passage of no works involved. Or is there? Let's find out. Ephesians 2, verse 8 through 10. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now everyone seems to memorize verse 8 and 9, but for some odd reason, the very next verse, verse 10, it just suddenly escapes their memory. In verse 10, read in context, rightly dividing, what this verse is not saying is that good works lead to salvation. What it's not saying is that in order to be saved we need to perform good works. That's not what this is saying here. But there's a lot of people out there who twist scripture to make it mean what they want it to mean to serve their hidden agendas. What this verse is saying however is that once we're saved then we have the capability in Christ Jesus to perform good works. You see the difference? 
The righteousness of Christ covers us and provides us with the power to perform good works, the fruit of our salvation. You see, without Jesus Christ, we're incapable of doing good works. It's impossible. Only through Him are we made capable. So these people trying to earn their way to heaven by good works will come up short each and every single time because their works are seen as filthy rags. Their works are based on their own power and not the power of Christ Jesus. Their power is nothing. It's polluted with their sins. It's filthy. In, in Romans chapter 8 verse 1 it reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So, we won't be judged on our sins. I mean, those are gone. We're beyond the reach of God's judgment as far as condemnation is concerned, okay? But in order for there to be a fair and righteous hearing, our indiscretions must be brought to light. In other words, the Lord is going to set the record straight without forgetting that we're His children and fellow heirs in Christ. For example, the pastor or the, who, who takes money from people on the pretext that the money is going to be used to feed the poor in his city, but instead, secretly, He's using the money that he gets from people to pay his bills first, to buy his family extra stuff, and the little money that's left over goes to buying cheap uh, toiletries that he passes out on the street, for example. He may think he's, he's gotten away with it, but at the day his evil deeds will be exposed and laid out before the Lord's throne, it will bring him much sorrow. Those poor people who were deceived into giving him money will be richly rewarded for their sincere actions towards helping the homeless. But the pastor, on the other hand, will suffer shame and great loss for his actions. Paul warns ministers in the things of the Lord in this manner in, in this manner in First Timothy uh, chapter five. Verse 24, some men's sins are open beforehand, going before to judgment, and some men they follow after. Those who've had their reputations ruined at the hands of carnal believers have this promise. God will right all wrongs. In this connection, the, que the question often asked, will there be tears in heaven? As sure as the sun rises in the morning, you can count on it. These will be tears of regret and remorse over what could have been if only we'd remained faithful to him who loved us and gave himself for us. No doubt this time will be overwhelming, but the greatest regret will be when we see sorrow on our, our Lord's face for how we mistreated one each other one another as members of his body thankfully however all our tears will be wiped away at the close of this judgment for the saints and there shall be no more sorrow in 1st Corinthians chapter 4 verse 5 we read therefore Judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring light to the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we read, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. For we must all appear. We all have this appointment with our precious Lord Jesus. 
Paul makes frequent frequent references to the judgment seat of Christ in both his early and latter epistles. He deals extensively with the subject in, in the uh, Corinthian letters. Now, this isn't without rhyme or reason. Paul wanted the Corinthians to understand the gravity of their ungodly conduct. They seemed to be oblivious to the fact that someday they were going to stand before the Lord and give an account of their actions. Some denied this based on the assumption that, you know, we're, we're seated in, uh, with Christ in the heavenlies. This may be true positionally, but the matter is determined by our present conduct. The Corinthians would one day have to answer for their for the turmoil they caused in the local assembly. Due to their envy, their strife, their divisions and carnality and immoral lifestyles. We see in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 verse 10 and 11 according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Christ Jesus Christ and in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 uh, verses 12 to 15 now if any man build upon this foundation gold silver precious stones wood hay stubble every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work what sort it is if any man's work abide which he hath built there, thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. In verse 13 we see that fire shall try every man's work. Fire is a symbol of, of God's word, the Bible. All believers today are part of the body of Christ and our marching orders are found in the writings of Apostle Paul specifically Romans through Philemon we're going to be judged by the Word of God in light of the revelation of the mystery given only to Paul look at Romans 11 uh, let's see Romans 11 I don't have it up here on the thing but look at Romans 11 13 for for I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles I magnify mine office and in Romans 2 16 which I do have in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel let's read that again in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel who's speaking here Paul we're gonna be judged by the gospel given to Paul and that is the gospel of grace the mystery the secret that I've been talking about all this time remember this and remember it well as believers our works will be brought under the scrutiny of God's Word and there's gonna be two searching questions on that day the first one did we acknowledge Paul's apostleship and message to the Gentiles the second one were we obedient to the commands of Christ taught in his writings now of course the Lord will judge the members of his body on the basis of their faithfulness according to their ability to understand Paul's gospel the mystery given to Paul do some reading of uh, Ephesians chapter 3 1 through 21 read read Ephesians 3 1 through 21 and get a clear picture of this if you're still uncertain about how important Paul's writings are then take a look at 1st Corinthians chapter 14 verses 37 through 38 if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual 
let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Hear that? The things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Now, before I continue, keep in mind that we're discussing judgment of believers right now, okay? Not unbelievers. Moving on. Gold, silver, and precious stones represent our good works and faithful service. On the other hand, the wood, hay, and stubble represent those things that are done in the flesh, which are temporary in nature and will be burned up. There won't be any reward for uh, our good works done to impress other people. Only our good works done for and to the glory of God will bring rewards. Every man's work shall be made manifest. God is going to bring forth every man's work for a complete and thorough review. Paul is talking about the body of a man's work that he produced over the course of his Christian life. The judgment seat of Christ is a dispensational phrase solely found in Paul's epistles. It's referred to in his revelation as the day, that day, and the day of Christ. This particular judgment will be a review of the believer's conduct and service which takes place at the rapture of the church according to 1st Thessalonians this this is a, a planned meeting that was kept secret since the world began and you can read about that in Romans 16 and 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 now dear saints we won't be condemned but our actions and deeds just prior to our death or the rapture will be deter will determine what rewards we'll gain or lose at our judgment. I'm not telling you to work yourselves to death to gain rewards. It's the grace of God and His free gift of salvation that gives us the ability to do good deeds. We, we don't do good deeds to get saved and reap all kinds of rewards. We do it in response to our salvation. Faithful Christians will receive more honor, rewards, blessings, while less faithful Christians will receive less based on their lifestyles and attitudes. So, I ask you to be accountable. Do an honest survey of your Christian life. Ask yourselves, do you study God's Word daily or do you spend that time instead, let's say, watching television? Would you live the way you do right now if Christ was living with you? If He was with you all the time? Well, guess what? He is with you all the time and He knows everything you do and don't do. Take these things into consideration, my dear saints, because we're very, very close to being called up unto our Lord Jesus. It's close, brothers and sisters. Thanks so much for studying with me, and I'll be seeing you on the next video.